Amen. You may be seated. I want to ask you just to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 2. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. One of the things about, um, I love Paul's writing to Timothy. And he says to Timothy, you know, Timothy, I want you to give yourself to the reading of Scripture. So publicly read Scripture. It's not important. And you know what has happened in our digital age is we have a generation that don't know where the books of the Bible are, unfortunately. And I understand if you're a new Christian, it takes time to learn. But I want to really encourage you to actually open up a neither old school Bible or a digital app or whatever you have and turn there. Uh, po you know, whatever you need to do to get there. We're going to look at, I'm not putting every scripture on the screen intentionally, and uh, we just would really think it's a good thing to be able to follow along if you can. So Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. I'm actually going to be sharing this morning on the subject of shifting to an apostolic culture, what it means to shift to an apostolic culture in the sense of being a people that are apostolic. How many know before there was an apostolic church, Australia, there were apostles? <laughs> How many know that? How many know that before there were denominations, there were apostles, but there were also apostolic people? And that's the fact of the matter. So it has absolutely nothing to do with our titles, um, whether we recognize, you know, people as apostles or prophets. Um, it has everything to do with the culture, really the ethos of who we are. And it's, it's very important because this is something that is replete and embedded in the New Testament um, culture. And the book of Acts and the writings of Paul, it's always about sending, okay, sending. Um, the word for a, uh, send is apostello, okay? It, we get apostle from there. So look with me at, at, at uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others, some translations say 72, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, this is an amazing passage of Scripture because the first thing that we recognize is before Jesus went to the cross, before he died and rose again, he had already started sending out people to share the gospel. We know in, in the previous chapter in Luke, he had actually sent out the 12, the apostles. But here we read of 70 or 72, depending on the translation, that, you, that he sends them out. And really the focus is that these are really being sent more to the Gentiles and the apostles to, to, the, um, you know, to the Jews. There's a strong sense in which he's, he's saying it's not just enough for you, the 12, the apostles, to do this ministry. There's another group of people that I'm going to raise up. So it literally speaks of the equipping and the empowering of the entire body of Christ. Now, I'm not saying that these uh, were not, um, you know, part of fivefold ministry. The Bible really doesn't comment on that. But what we recognize here is that there were people who Jesus invested in, trained, equipped, and he sent them out because there was a need for more workers. And specifically, when you look at the world that we live in today with over 7 billion people, we have to ask ourselves a question. How many people have never heard the gospel once? Do you know there's close to 3 billion people that have still never heard the gospel? They don't have access to the gospel. We know there are many people in this nation, many people in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Americas in general, or even Europe, that have heard the gospel, but they've not responded to the gospel for one reason or the other. But I'm talking about those who've not even heard it. They've never heard the gospel. And it's an amazing thing that I believe 
there's another slant that is even more impacting, and that is that Jesus said in Matthew 24 that when the gospel of the kingdom is preached as a witness to all the nations throughout the world, then the end will come. So he's saying that we have to finish the task. The more diligent we are, the more committed we are to take the gospel to unreached people, the quicker Jesus is coming back. 2 Peter 3.12 says that we're to hasten, we're to be looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. How can we hasten? Some translations say hurry along. Another says speed it up. How can we hasten, hurry along, speed up the coming of the day of God? Preach the gospel of the kingdom as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. And so the responsibility is to be a going people. You know, we want, we looked at, in our Western culture, we gauge the success of churches by what our seating capacity is, but rather it shouldn't be that, it should be our sending capacity. It's, it's, God doesn't want just growing churches, He wants going churches. It doesn't matter how many people we have per se, and, and, we, and I, we believe certainly that God wants to reach many people here, and, and He's not willing that any should perish, and there are thousands of people, and we need to be active and we need to be engaged in evangelism and testifying of the gospel here in Perth. Absolutely, and we, we should be doing that as a lifestyle. We don't need a program as Christians that is, you know, implemented from the top down. We need to make this a lifestyle that everywhere we go, we're a sharing, giving, going people that spread the love of Jesus to everywhere we go. It's an organic, natural thing that's an overflow of our relationship. And... The fact of the matter is that we do need to be intentional when it comes to reaching people that have never heard the gospel. You know, it's, it's a, can you imagine if you came to the end of your life, you died, went to that place that was prepared for the devil and his angels, and the reality is you never heard the gospel. There's some people that say, well, God's not going to send anybody to hell if they've never heard the gospel. And the fact of the matter is, guys, the responsibility is with us. If the truth of the matter is that everyone who doesn't hear the gospel is automatically exempted and given a backdoor pass into heaven, then the best and the wisest thing the church can do is stop preaching the gospel. Because that means people won't hear it and they'll automatically be pardoned and allowed in. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the argument of absurdity. The reality is God says in Romans chapter 1 that everything about himself has been made manifest through creation. The invisible attributes of God are made manifest, the t creation testifies. And then in the next chapter, he says that inside each one of us is an innate knowledge that there is a creator. But the, the, the responsibility to seek after God is ours. And there are those people that we read about in the Bible and their stories that we've all heard about, people that have never heard the gospel before, but they've, they began to just seek after God. They maybe didn't know His name. They maybe called Him by something else, but they began to seek after God. There are even people of other religions that have really begun to seek after God, and then in that place of just seeking after God, they've had these encounters Sometimes Jesus has appeared to them. Other times angels have spoken to them and told them where to go and hear the gospel. It's an amazing thing. I, I've actually had an experience when I was in Africa once where someone came from a village, who, uh, they, a village that was full of idolatry, and literally what ended up happening is this man had a dream, and in the dream he was told where to go, and it was like about 60 or 70 miles for him to walk by foot, and he walked to where we were doing a crusade, and he heard the gospel and he got saved. He had a dream. He said, go here, go to this village, and you're going to hear the words of life, is what he was told in the dream. You'll hear the words of life. He had no idea what the gospel was. He'd heard the name Jesus, but he didn't, under, he didn't know the story. And I'm going to tell you that there is a responsibility that we all have to share the gospel. It's not just the call of a few it's not just like, well, those who can afford it, those who can garner enough support, those who literally have the, the faith can do this, but God knows I've got obligations, I've got things in my life that I have to do, I can't go. Well, the fact is, 
God addresses these excuses here in this passage. In Luke chapter 10, I want you to look at this very closely. Jesus chooses 70 and he sends them out. The word sent out is apostello. He sends them out. But in the next verse, he tells these same ones and his apostles to pray that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his harvest. Interestingly, the word that is translated send out in this verse is a completely different word that's translated send out in the preceding verse. In the first verse, it's apostello. In this verse, it's ekbalo. Ekbalo is a very interesting term. It's literally the word that is used where Jesus said to cast out or drive out demons. It means to compel one to depart. It's a bid to someone to depart. It's stern, but not necessarily violent. It's the same word Jesus uses in Luke chapter 11, 14, and 15, as I said, for casting out demons. It's the same word when Paul was thrown into prison, Acts 16, 37. It's the same word used when Stephen was cast out of the city and stoned, Acts chapter 7, verse 58. When Jesus drove out the money changers from the temple, he was ekbaloing them. It's a very strong word. And I really believe what God is saying here is that there are some people that have put up their hand and said, yes, Lord, I'll go. I'll share the gospel. I'll testify. I'll spread your love. I'll do what it takes because people are lost. They're going to die and they're going to go to hell. And I'm ready and, and I'm willing to do it. And so they put up their hand and God says, okay, I'll send you out. I apostello you. I send you out. As the Father sent me, so send I you. And so he releases those people and he sends them out. And we realize there is a process for this. In Acts chapter 13, we see the first example of Paul being commissioned to become an apostle where while he is there with other ministry leaders in the church, they're serving, they're waiting on the Lord. And then what happens is the word of the Lord through a prophetic word comes forth and says, separate Saul and Barnabas to the work that I've called them to do. And so what happens is they lay hands on Paul, Saul, and Barnabas, and then it says that they said, okay, you know, they laid hands and they sent them out. And then the comment that is made in verse 4 is, and so they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Now, interestingly, it was after they laid hands on them in response to a prophetic word and said, we send you out in the name of Yeshua to preach the gospel that the writer says, and so they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? So, you know, there's some that, that were sent, and there's others that just grabbed a microphone and went. And the reality is there has to be a sending. There has to be a sense in which we validate those who are called. There has to be a sense in which we say, yes, there's a calling here. This is apostolic ministry. But the interesting thing is when we're talking about just being an apostolic people, not necessarily being called to the office and that gift of, and ministry of an apostle, that ministry of an apostle, but just being an apostolic people, meaning a people that are a going people, a people that are saying, I'm going to be intentional about sharing the gospel. I'm going to go to places. I'm going to go to people, and I am going to make sure that I share the love of Jesus intentionally. And that can become a lifestyle. That can become something where you do that uh, almost automatically because you've so rewired the way you think that your lifestyle now is every person you see, you see them as an opportunity to manifest and share the love of Jesus Christ to them. Yes. And when you do that, and when you begin to think that way, then what happens is you're responding to what Jesus said, where he says in the next verse, in verse 2 of Luke 10, pray that God will ekbalo. What does it mean that if God will ekbalo? So there's something here that implies that a little bit of force is needed. There's something here because it's like he's saying, you know, the 70, I'm glad you put up your hand. I'm, I'm very happy that you're willing to go to other places and share the gospel, but it's not enough. It's not enough because the harvest is so great 
There's so many people that don't know Jesus, and the laborers are few. So God has to ekbalo some people because we're too comfortable to go. We're too stuck and set in our ways that he has to force us. And there's different ways that God does that. Come on. There's different ways that God does that. One of the ways is he just wrecks, our, he wrecks us spiritually. He just like totally overwhelms us with his love and his compassion where we end up saying like the Apostle Paul did in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, for the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ compels us. So now we're compelled. I'm compelled. I can't sit back. I can't keep my mouth closed. I've got to share the gospel with the person in the cafe, with the person I work with. I've got to tell them about the love of God because the love of God compels me, and I just can't be quiet. That's God's preferred modus operandi, that we would be moved from within. Like it says in Romans chapter 9, Paul says, I tell the truth in Christ. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have unceasing anguish and continual grief, and I wish that I myself could be accursed, cut off from Christ for the sake of my kinsman Israel. In other words, Paul was saying, if it would result in their salvation, I would be willing to be eternally separated from Christ if it would result in the salvation of my countrymen. Wow, that is deep, what he's saying, so profound. So how can we sit back? And if we won't allow the love of Christ to compel us, then God has other ways to unstick us. One of the words of Christ in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is he said, I've called you, my people, everyone who's filled with the Holy Spirit, to take the gospel to be a witness unto Jesus in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. I've called you to do it. When you look at the early church in the book of Acts, there was a point where they had been faithful. They'd shared the gospel in Jerusalem and Judea, but they hadn't really taken the gospel beyond the, those rare areas. So what happens, interestingly, in verse Acts 1, 8, and Acts 8, verse 1, we hear there's a persecution that breaks out. And this persecution, literally, every believer is scattered throughout the Roman Greco world at that time. The apostles stay put in Jerusalem, but the believers are scattered. And it says in verse number 4 that those believers, wherever they went, they preached the word. This is not the apostles. These are not the pastors. These are not the people who, you know, we would say are professional clergy or whatever term we would want to use. These are the ordinary average people who realize they have a responsibility to preach the gospel. And because they had become comfortable, because they had become insulated in, in what they were doing, Jesus literally allows a persecution to ekbalo them. Kick them out of their comfort zone. Come on. Some of us need kicked out of our comfort zones. And, you know, the eagle will take the baby when it's, when it's ready, you know, and he feels, okay, this, this eaglet is ready. And it, it has to learn to fly. And he's been comfortable in this nest, but long enough of comfort in the nest. And that eagle will soar up to great heights with that eaglet and eventually will drop that eagle. Drop that baby eagle, and that baby eagle doesn't know how to fly, and it's turning upside down and sideways, and, and then what ends up happening is the, is the mother will eventually come down and grab it and swoop and pick it up again, and will continue this process until eventually the eagle learns to fly. And there's a place where God is saying, we must go as a church, that we must be willing to step out. Stop bringing people to me. You heal them. You share the gospel. You deliver them because the same Holy Spirit that is in me is in you. 
And I understand if you go, well, I'm not comfortable. I don't know what I'm doing. Yes, we can help equip you and train you. But trust me, you will have a 100% failure rate if you do nothing. If you do something so well, maybe you, they didn't get healed. But try it. Pray for them. Pray for their deliverance. Pray for their healing. Lead them to Jesus. You don't need to bring them to church. You can introduce them to Jesus anywhere. Yes, church is important for discipleship, for fellowship. Absolutely. But you don't need to bring them to church. You bring Jesus to them. And in the culture in which we're living, it's become more and more obvious that we have to do things a little bit more creatively. One of the challenges that we're facing in Manila is the fact that there are so many people that work on Sundays, and there's no way they're going to be able to get to church on a Sunday. So we have realized that we have to come up with strategies to take the church to them. So we, so we are looking at taking the church into businesses, into, into corporate offices, into wherever, so that people can meet, they can hear the gospel, and they can receive the word of God, believe, and be saved. When we were over there in, um, I believe it was April, we ended up went into a spa. And when we went into the spa, we were, there was like 25 employees there that worked in the spa. And we were able to prophesy and pray for them and lead them to Christ. Right in the business. Right. And we had one case of demonic manifestation. Because we took the gospel to them. We had said, they're not going to come, most of them, to hear the gospel at a church because the reality is they work every Sunday, every week. They work six, seven days a week, 15, 16 hours a day, many of them. Realize that's an issue. I understand that. But let me tell you, when that's your only way of surviving, and you don't have the money, you think, you've got to commend them for that at least. They're not sitting at home. There's no welfare. You're going to work or you're going to go hungry. It's very simple. And the reality is, this is something that we are called to take the gospel to people. We're called to be an apostolic people. And when you look at this particular passage, Jesus says, church, people, start praying. Start praying. What are we supposed to start praying? Start praying that God would begin to move in the hearts of people and ekbalo them. Ekbalo them. Dislodge them. Remove the hindrances. Yes. The things that are causing them to be stuck. Fear. Anxiety. Guilt. Shame. Pray that they're unstuck. Pray that they begin to do what the Father's called them to do because the harvest is great. It's vast. There's so many people that don't know Jesus, so many people that are lost. If we could just get that into us, what is it like to be eternally separated from God? We don't even talk about it anymore. What is it like to be eternally separated from God? What is it like? Paul said, I'll pay any price. He said in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, I will gladly spend myself and all that I have. I'll do whatever it takes. And we're so focused. What Jesus said in Luke chapter 8, he says, you know, some people, they hear the word. But the word, it's like it's sown among thorns. The, it begins to grow, it begins to germinate. But then these thorns come along and they choke out the word. And he said, these are they which the cares of life, the pleasures of this world, all of those things, riches, have choked out the word in their life so that they have absolutely no sense of the priorities of God. They're focused on their own lives, focused on their own careers, focused on their own families, and there's time for families, there's time for careers. I understand that. But the ultimate thing that we're called to do is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. 
God isn't looking for another Billy Graham. I don't believe that. God isn't necessarily looking for another Reinhard Bonnke, even though there's a place for great men of God who preach to the multitudes. But if we could understand that each one of us is called to share the gospel, that each one of us has access to the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that each one of us has a commissioning, and the commission is your permission and also God's provision that you can do what he's called you to do. Do it. Go. Pray the Lord of the harvest would send out more laborers into his harvest field. As we do that, as we begin to be intentional on praying, people are going to be motivated. God, remove every excuse from my life. Remove everything that is distracting me from sharing the gospel. Do you know why the enemy attacks people? Not just to destroy you, but to distract you. You see, if you're constantly putting out fires in your life, if you're constantly putting out fires in your workplace, in a church even, the enemy loves that because you're focused on things that are holding you back from doing what is most important. So it's not just to destroy your faith, but it's to distract you. Martha came to Jesus. Jesus, here's Mary, my sister. She's just sitting at your feet like, this isn't right. Tell her to get off her and start helping me. And Jesus looks at Martha, and you know you're in trouble when he says your name twice. <laughs> Martha, Martha. Uh-oh, he said my name twice. <laughs> well, you're troubled about many things, but only one thing is needed. The Greek is you're being pulled in all these different directions. You're being, you're being distracted. You're not doing what is important. It's very simple. We're called to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Spend time loving Jesus, knowing him. I shared on Wednesday that his heart becomes your heart. And the things that matter to him just become so real to you that you become so enamored with him, with his goodness, his grace, knowing him, and to love people to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to make disciples. That's it. The great commandment, the great commission. Let's not make it too difficult. And one of the dangers in the Western church is that we have become so organized in our church services that we literally, all the people resources and the money resources are being used typically, often, for the same select group of Christians week after week. Less than one and a half percent of the missions budget from Christians worldwide goes to reach people who have never heard the gospel. Less than two percent of the missions budget that is literally billions and billions of dollars from America alone Less than 2% of that is used to reach people who've never heard the gospel. There are more missionaries in Alaska than there is in the entire Muslim world. Americans spend more money on pet food than they do on missions. Christians. The average Christian in America, sorry, I don't know the stats here, gives 2.2%. 5% of their income, that's everything, tithe, offering, missions, televangelists, which is a dying breed, less than 2%, many of them, 3%, that's what they give. Less. The average Christian, thank God for the faithful. But guys, it's not a case of, well, I just can't do it, or you want my money, 
actually, I don't want your money. And I, God doesn't want your money if that's your attitude. Can I be honest? God loves a cheerful giver. But you have to be cheerful because you realize there's someone like the young man in the video who was a drug dealer, a gangster, carried a gun, shot people, who saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and his family's on fire for God, and he serves at Ignite Church Bakuna now. And he's win, win, winning people and leading them to Jesus. You see, that's the reality of what has to motivate us. So, yes, Lord, you can send me. I'll go anywhere. You know, that should be our attitude. Lord, do you want me to quit my job? Do you want me to move here or there? I'll do it. I'll move. I'll do it, whatever you call me to do. Now, don't do it <laughs> if God hasn't called you to do it, because not everyone. But I want to tell you this. On the other hand, we often use that as an excuse. The Bible says it's a noble thing to desire to serve God. It's a noble aspiration. It's something worthy of consideration at prayerfully. Oh, God, do you want me to do this? Do you want me to give myself to prayer and fasting and seeking your face? Do you want me to, to pour my life into you and helping other people? I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm open. And guess what will happen? God has his way if you're called. There was a time when I was in ministry I can tell you, Lynn and I were in ministry, and I tried to get out of ministry. It was a long time ago, <laughs> over 20 years ago. We had been in ministry, and then one day I just said, that's it, I don't want to do ministry anymore. I'm just going to get a job. And, and I was offered some great jobs, government jobs, right? And all of these great jobs and end up Oh, yeah, Glenn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, we wanna, we're going to hire you for sure. And yes, this and that. And then next thing you know, no response. No response. Weeks, months, no response. So, oh, we're still working on things. We don't know. And this kept happening and happening. And then finally, after like two years of me trying to get out of ministry and just like, I'll just get a job, preach once in a while, after about two years of this, it was like God said to me, you know what? Don't you get what, the point? Don't you see what's happening here? Like there's no, you're not, no doors are going to open, Glenn. You can apply for six million jobs uh, next week and you won't get one. I'll close every door. No, I mean, they'll, they might send, ask you to interview you and say, yeah, we're keen, but you won't get hired, trust me. And yeah, and then I ended up, I did get hired for one job and it was so terrible. And ended up after two, after like a week of that, they said, they, they, oh, we're gonna, we don't need you anymore. We're restructuring. So that was the only job I got. It lasted like one week. <laughs> and it was terrible. Oh, I was gonna quit it, but they let me go before I had to quit. <laughs> you see, if you're called, there's no way. God's going to ekbalo you. He's going to make a way for you to be pushed into that place that you need to go. So you might be in a place, listen, when God is moving in your life, I'll tell you something. If God wants to send you in a new direction, if God has a plan and a purpose for you to move into a new assignment, He will work in at least three ways. He'll, you'll see the dissipation of your resources. The place of provision sometimes will dry up. Like Elijah, the brook will run dry. And you can't stay where you are. You've got to move. That's one way. Another way is relationships. I'm not talking about covenant marriage relationships relationships. All of a sudden, people that you're walking with, people that you're working with, and these re relationships begin to fragment. Like David and King Achish of the Philistines. It was time for David to go back to Israel. And so, he was sent. He was ekbalod 
by the king. Another way is God will disrupt your plans. He'll disrupt your plans. You've got this plan, that plan, here's my plans. He'll disrupt your plans. It won't work out. It won't happen. Ask the worship team to come forward, please. Let's stand together. If you're in a place... If you're in a place this morning where you just feel, Lord, I want to do something significant, just don't go and quit your job, okay? <laughs> don't do that. Because sometimes what you think is insignificant is significant, and it might be that really the thing that needs to change is you, not the job. Because right? what the Bible says, we have to learn to be content in everything. And people that learn to be content and say, hey, God, I'll do it. I don't care. It's all good. I'll do whatever you want me to do without complaining. Those type of people are the ones who God can promote because they've learned to rest in Him. The people that have learned to rest in Him, thank you, are the ones that He can use. Our rest is in Jesus. It's not in a new relationship, a new job, or a new assignment. It's in Him. And He's the one who can change things. But if you're here and you just this sense that I, I just want to do something significant for God, I want to pray with you this morning. I want to make an impact. Well, you can go. You can go on a mission trip, absolutely. You can move to a country if God wants you to do that that's fine but the bottom line is you need to begin going here begin going right here in Perth everyone around you Jesus said the world is a harvest field everywhere we look it's harvest time it's harvest time it's time to reach people so begin to go shift the way you think shift the way you live begin to go just begin to just make yourself available to the Father. Just begin to press into Him and love Him in a greater way and just tell Him that you're available. And just begin to ask Him to start using you. Lord, use me to be a light in the darkness. You know, your job everywhere you go, my job is to share Jesus everywhere we go. Pray for God to unstick people, to ekbalo people. People that are not going but need to be going. We're going to pray that this morning because the Father knows exactly where we're at. Can we just remove any obstacle? Because you can go. You can begin to pray for people. And you may be not able to go to another nation because of certain circumstances, but you can begin to go to your neighbor to your family, to your friends. You can begin to take the love of Jesus to them in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we thank you this morning that you call people, you send people. You're ascending God. But you also told us to pray to you. Jesus said that we're to pray to you, Father, because you're the Lord of the harvest. And we're to pray to you that you would ekbalo. You would ekbalo more workers into the harvest fields people that are willing, people that would say, Lord, all right, you've made it obvious, you've made it apparent, you, you put the pressure on me and I realize what you're saying and I'm ready, I'm ready to step out, I'm ready to begin sharing, I'm going to go wherever you want me to go and I want to say to you this morning that God can call you to ministry. He can actually call you. He can speak to you in a dream. He can give you a, a burden, and he can call you into ministry. You can receive an encounter with Jesus that says, yes, you're called to preach the gospel. I'm praying that that begins to happen in this church, that people would begin to realize, and then we can work together to develop you, to see you ramped up, 
and made ready to do the things the Father has you to do. And there are people who say, well, how's it going to work? I don't know. That's not my job. That's not your job. That's God's job. Trust Him. Trust Him. It's not about a job, guys. It's about a calling. Whether you, you're paid for it or you're not paid for it, it's a calling. And that is what we have to respond to. All of us are called to be an apostolic people, to be a people that go. Not just a people that come to church, not just a people that watch Todd White on YouTube or whatever. But let's be a people that go everywhere. Everywhere. Let's go. Let's begin to share the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit.